This morning we'll be continuing in Colossians. So if you will turn to Colossians chapter 2. I'll be reading from verses 24 from the previous chapter, so maybe you want to turn there. And the reason is is that it gives us a context of our text. It helps us understand what Paul means. And before I read, uh, just uh, want to give a, a note that this message is mainly directed to believers, those who have been united to Christ by faith. And the reason for that is because Paul is writing to the church in Colossae, and he's directing uh, this his conflict, his great conflict, to the church in Colossae, those who in Laodicea, and other believers in the surrounding area. But if you are an unbeliever, I want to say that you are not totally detached and isolated. I want to say that any time that the Word of God is preached, it stands as an invitation for you to come. And all the benefits that I am going to be talking about here in this text is for the church. But those benefits come to you in Christ. And so the call is, come to Christ. We offer no benefits apart from Christ. But in Christ, everything that there is to be had in salvation. And so, beginning in chapter 1, verse 24. I now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ, for the sake of his body, which is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end I labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. And now our text in chapter 2, verse 1. For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face, my face in the flesh that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge or toward the knowledge or into the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with per persuasive words. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in the spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and, and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. And so, in our text, it's just a continuation of the thoughts that we had saw, saw previous in the previous verses. Paul was talking about his ministry that God has given to him, the stewardship from God to declare the mystery of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the mystery of Christ in you, the hope of glory, that message. And this burden, Paul is saying that he has specifically for the church in Colossians, for the, the church in Laodicea, and others who haven't seen him in person. Seen him, seen, whenever it says seen his face in the flesh, it just means hasn't seen him face to face. He hasn't been there in person, but the work of God is there and the kingdom of God is present. And so Paul is saying that this ministry that I have is given to me for you. Paul is having them in his mind, on his heart, in his prayers. And that's what we saw in, in chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. And so, just to summarize what I think uh, verses 1 through 5 mean, 
Paul is saying that this burden, this great conflict, as it says, according to the ministry that has been given to him by God, in other words, he's participating in what God is working in. As we saw in verse 29 of chapter 1, to this end I labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. And that's encouraging because these burdens that Paul discloses to the church, being encouraged in their heart, having their hearts encouraged, uh, being knit together in love, attaining to all the riches of the full assurance of understanding, Paul doesn't have a new burden. This burden is in God. This is what God wants for his church. And that's extremely encouraging. And he allows Paul to participate in bringing that about through the preaching or the declaration of the mystery of God. And so Paul has the burden that this church in court, uh, in Col Colossae and those in Laodicea and others in the surrounding area and, and God's burden for us is that we would grow into the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, the mystery of who God has revealed himself to be in Christ, who he, who he is in the gospel for us, and that by doing so, as we grow in the knowledge of this mystery, we would be encouraged in our hearts that we would be knit together in love and that we would attain to all the riches of the full assurance of understanding. These three benefits, I believe, are connected to this church's and ours pursuit of the knowledge of the mystery of God in the gospel. In other words, how are these believers going to receive all the riches of the full assurance of understanding? Verse 3, by going to him and knowing him in whom are hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Paul didn't just uh, coincidentally write treasures there. He's connecting it to the previous verse or the previous statement. All riches. Where are you going to find all riches in him in whom are hidden all treasures? And so where are we to uh, find strength to be knit together in love? Later on in the chapter, verse 19 says, By holding fast to the head from whom all the body nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments growing with the increase that is from God. So how we grow together in love, being knit together in love, by holding fast our head, Christ. And how are our hearts to be encouraged? The point is the same. The mystery of God, the gospel. And so it is through the declaration of this mystery that Christ builds his church. And this is what we have been seeing in chapter 1, in verses 3 through 6, it says, We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying for you always, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all the saints. There are two fruits, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, love for the saints. Because, now here's the source of that fruit, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before, and the word of the truth of the gospel. There is the source of their fruit, which has come to you, as it has in also in all the world, and is bringing forth fruit, as it is also among you, since the day that you heard of it and knew the grace of God and truth. And so it is by knowing who God is and who he has revealed himself to be, the full disclosure of God in the person of Jesus Christ in the gospel, that the church grows. So this is the ministry of the church. It's not just a one of the ministries of the church. This is the ministry of the church, the gospel ministry. 
And so where the word of the truth of the gospel is found, there the kingdom of God is present, and there the work of the new creation is working. This is why Paul says at the end of Colossians in chapter 4, verse 3, he asks for a door to be opened to him. Now he's writing this in prison. The only door that he sees right in front of him is the door of his prison cell. And he asks for a door to be open. Which door does he ask for to be open? Not his prison cell door, but for the word to speak the mystery of Christ. That's his burden. And so that's the burden that he has for the church in Colossae. His burden is that they would grow in the knowledge of the mystery of God, the revelation of who God is in the gospel, and that they would move towards growth in knowledge of who God is, and that these three benefits come out of that. We see these three benefits in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 2 in Colossians. For I want you to know what great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, and for as many as not has not seen my face in the flesh. One, that their hearts may be encouraged. Two, being knit together in love. Three, attaining all riches of full assurance of understanding. And each one of these is important, and I want to go into each one. Encouragement. I'm going to spend most of the, of the time on this one. And the reason why is because I'm going to spend more time on this one than the other two because I have the impression that the church in general, at least in our circles, needs encouragement in the gospel, in Christ. And we've heard this past Wednesday that the church in Laredo, there's a burden that they need encouragement. And I believe that there are more churches. I believe that we need encouragement. This is the burden that Paul has and that God has for us. I have an impression that we don't really receive the extent of the gospel that we should. The comfort, the encouragement, the warmth that is afforded to us in Christ. And and so what I'm saying is that this, that their hearts may be encouraged, I think we tend to think that this is a bonus, like an add-on. It's okay if you get it. But I think in Paul's mind, this is absolutely necessary. Paul, whenever he's writing this, is not just being sentimental towards the church in Colossae. I think in Paul's mind, this is very very much so intertwined into the very fabric of the benefits that God gives to us in the gospel. Comfort, encouragement. I wonder how many here might think that encourage, encouragement is just optional. It's really nice to have, but it's not one of the main things that's given to us in the Christian life kind of like how we might be tempted to misrepresent joy. It's, it's not always available. It's not always promise. It's a bonus. I think that's a misrepresentation of what God has given to us in the gospel. And the more and more that I see Christ in the gospel, the more and more I'm convinced that the warmth, the comfort, the joy, the freedom that has been given to us in the Christian life is promised. It's not just a bonus. In fact, I would say that it is the fuel for the Christian life. In other words, without encouragement, without comfort, you will feel empty and paralyzed. You, you won't be able to function well. Just like a brother Jeremy said this morning, that it will all be duty. Onward, Christian soldier. 
but there will be no, no substance. You, you'll feel like you're lacking. You'll feel very distant from God. No encouragement, comfort is necessary. This is what the word of the gospel brings to us, the word of Christ. This is what God brings to us in the gospel. He liberates our hearts to comfort, joy, and freedom. So just a few verses. I want to convince you that this isn't just a bonus. Paul, whenever he writes this, he writes it with two other necessary things. For Second Thessalonians, you don't have to turn there. Second Thessalonians 2, verse 16 says, Now may the Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father, who has loved us and given us, now here's a, a summary or a characterization of the salvation that God has given to us, who has given us everlasting consolation, everlasting comfort, and good hope by grace. May he comfort your hearts. Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and God of all comfort. And so we're seeing here that God is identified as the God of all comfort, and then continuing, who comforts us in all of our affliction. And so if you're still unconvinced that this is a necessary fruit that the gospel brings, who does Jesus Christ call the Spirit of God to his disciples whenever he leaves and goes to the Father? The Spirit who is promised to be with us forever. The Spirit who, who performs every work in the kingdom. Calls him the Comforter who will comfort you. Comfort and encouragement is promised to us. And there are more and more verses, but I just want to, wanted to convince to you that this is not just an anomaly. I think that we might be tended to kind of skip over that their hearts may be encouraged. This is what the knowledge of the mystery of God brings about. But before we get to the the mystery, there's two other things that this mystery brings about in the lives of Christians. Being knit together in love is the second thing. Being knit together in love is the very thing that makes us the church, united together un under one head, Christ. Sin has broken relationships the fall is a series and a cascade of broken relationships. Broken relationship with God, broken relationship with one another, and broken relationship with creation. But in Christ, in the gospel, God has forged, joined together, united what sin has torn apart. In Christ, we are united to God. And He pours the love of God into our heart. And, and, and through that, People are then united together under Christ, in Christ. So our identity is rooted not in gender, not in ethnicity, not in nationality. Our identity is rooted in the humanity of the resurrected Christ. It's in Him. And so therefore, the church knows a unity, a love, a knitting together that nothing in the fallen creation knows. And what God has joined together, let no one put us under. Notice, it's being knit together. These believers are believers. They have come to faith in Christ, and Paul says that He's uh, that they have a steadfast faith in Christ. And so they're already joined together as a church. But it's saying being knit together, meaning that there is an, an increasing. We are not yet perfected. We still have sin remaining in us. We still have relational conflict, even within the church. And so we need to grow. We need to grow in our love for one another. And that's why I think he says being knit together. And also notice that 
being knit together is in the context of knowing the mystery of God. In other words, you cannot, outside the context of the church, pursue a knowing relationship with God. In other words, the church is the pillar and the ground, the buttress of the truth. We're not, that's not saying that the church is the source of truth. The God's word that he has given to the church is the source of truth. The person of Christ whom, whom is united to the church is the truth. But nonetheless, is the church is united to Christ, and therefore it is through the church that the manifold wisdom of God is displayed. In other words, if you try to know God outside of the church, you will not know God if you reject his church. Another thing that I think that uh, just a, a small application of this is being joined together in the context of knowing God, all the riches of full assurance of understanding, who God is and what he has done to us in salvation. That means that you don't just read your Bible at home and say that's okay, but we come together to know God. In other words, knowing God is something that we do together, and truth is given to us as a church to grow together. Otherwise, you would not be sitting here listening to this right now. It is also, I think, good and right, maybe even more than that, to receive writings from those who have gone before us. People have written books that give us un a better understanding of know knowing God. That is, I think, knowing God in the context of, church, of the church. We're receiving from God what He has given to the church through one another. Three, all riches of full assurance of understanding. Paul is being very emphatic here. Notice, it's not just riches, it's all riches. It's not just assurance, it's full assurance of understanding. That is, that you know. Not just that you know, but that you know you know. You're aware that you know. And that in knowing that you know, you sense the liberty and the freedom and the glory and the certainty of what you know, what God has revealed to us in the gospel. I believe Peter captures, captures the riches here in, in 1 Peter 1, verse 8. Though you do not now see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Meaning, you know him. Even though you don't see him, you know him. And you know you know him. And Paul wants the believers to be assured that they know him. God intends for us to know him and to know that we know him, to have the assurance that we know him. This is not saying that we understand everything that there is to be known about God, but it does mean a certainty regarding knowing him. It means that God has revealed him in such a way that he can truly be known and with certainty. In 1 John 5, verse 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Christianity is a religion of assurance. And you know what? False doctrine leads people not into greater and greater degrees of assurance. Gnosticism, the secret knowledge, actually leads to further and further and further unassurance. And this right here, the fact that God has, has come down so much so that we can be certain that we know who He is, is good news. God does not intend for us to be unassured. God does not leave us in the dark. He intends for us to know all the riches of the full assurance of understanding.
And how do we, how do we receive that? Through the knowledge of the mystery of God, both the Father and the Son. Notice that Paul is saying this to believers, meaning believers stru- really do struggle with assurance. And maybe even a lot of them. And I think that it's not that they know that God sent His Son to save sinners. They know the truth, but they don't see that attached to themselves. They don't see how they connect to that. And without that connection to Christ, without that connection to Him, His person, the gospel, what has been revealed, I will never be assured. I always have lingering doubts. But God does not want us to have lingering doubts. He wants us to be fully assured. One thing to note is that whenever the gospel is offered, whenever the gospel is is declared in your presence, God really intends for you to come. In other words, it's not as if God is putting bait out there and then taking it away as soon as you come. No. When the gospel is declared, when the gospel is preached, whenever Christ is proclaimed and put before you, you can come to Him. That is good news. He came down all the way. And now through the preaching of the gospel by the Spirit, notice that these three things go together. Encouragement of the heart, knitting together, uh, in love and the full assurance, the all riches of full assurance of understanding, they go together. And without one of these, uh, it's disastrous. Without comfort and encouragement, we're paralyzed. Without love, we can't know God, for God is love. And without assurance of understanding, we're left in dar- darkness and confusion. And so you see how Paul, in his mind, these three benefits that come out of the knowledge of God's mystery of the gospel of Jesus Christ, who God is revealed in the gospel of Father, Son, and Spirit, how important it is that these things are, are, are brought about in our lives, in our Christian living. And so how, how are these things brought about in our lives? Verse 2 of chapter 2, it's as we grow, it says to, the word uh, could be translated into or toward the knowledge of God's mystery, both of the Father and of the Son. And so just to review, what is mystery? It's not something that you can't know. Remember? It's something that has been hidden in the past, but now revealed. And also with mystery has the idea that it's not something that you could think up on your own. It's something that is revealed. And so part of our our Christian confession is that truth is not attained. It's revealed. It's given. So just like salvation is by grace alone, so is revelation. It's by grace alone. In other words, God gives it. It's not us through our own ingenuity, through our own spirituality, through human moral decision making, through uh, our philosophical inquiry that we climb a ladder in order to view God, to know who God is. No. In Christianity, our confession is that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. God came down and revealed himself who is the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ. And this is fresh encouragement because you cannot climb a ladder to attain. And many people try, and many many people say that they have, and they viewed God. But if you come to God apart from the way that He has come down to us and condescended to us in the Word made flesh, you do not know God. And so this is why it's so important that we know the mystery of God, both of the Father and the Son. 
and your KJV, if you're reading a King James Version, it may look like there's three different mysteries going on. The mystery of God, and the mystery of the Father, and the mystery of Christ. But no, this is one mystery. It's a mystery of God, both of the Father and of the Son. If you have an ESV, if you're reading an ESV, you'll read of the mystery, which is Christ. So where'd the Father go? And so is it the mystery of Christ or is it the mystery of both the Father and the Son? Yes. Why? Because Christ said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In other words, the Father indwells Christ. Christ reveals to us the Father. Well, what about the Spirit? Why doesn't it say the mystery of God, but all three of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Because it's the Spirit of God that reveals to us who the Son is, who then reveals to us the Father. This is the mystery of God. God, in this mystery, through the declaration of the gospel, has revealed his identity. In other words, who God most deeply is, God has revealed that to us through the gospel. And you can know him in this, in this gospel. And so in salvation, God reveals to us his name, in Matthew 28, for the first time in all Scripture, we read the name of God pronounced as it really should, the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In other words, Christ has come down to tell us God's name. Well, why didn't God fully disclose himself in times past? Why didn't he just all together at once reveal himself and I would say that when you tell someone your name you tell them in person and that's exactly what happens and when Christ comes down and reveals to us the Father first John or John 1 verse 18 and so in the gospel God reveals who he most deeply is one note, God is not essentially creator. God is not essentially sovereign. God is not essentially ruler. Why do I say that? God is essentially Father, Son, and Spirit. If God was essentially creator, then he needs creation in order to be who he is. If God is most essentially ruler, then he needs subjects in order to rule over. But no, we're seeing who God is before creation. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, together, as we heard in the prayer meeting, this is who God is in love, in relationship, eternal fellowship, in the Godhead. God is love. And this is important because God is not a single person God. Unlike the true and living God, the triune God, a single person God cannot be relational. A single person God, when related with, is needy. And whenever he actually does give something to you what he really wants is something from you a transaction but in the revelation of the trinity what we see is God himself come down and continue in relationship in our own humanity the son loving the father the father loving the son by the spirit and this love through the cross is what God has come to give to us. And this is good news. It is natural for God to give life to another. He's been doing it for all eternity. It is natural for God to love another. Why? Because he's been doing it from all eternity. The Father loving the Son, the Son loving the Father. Another thing 
the Trinity shapes not just creation, revelation, but our whole understanding of salvation. In other words, in salvation, God doesn't just give us something called salvation. He gives us himself. Now, why? Because God has always been giving himself to another in all eternity. It's not unnatural to him. And as we heard, we don't, we don't, he doesn't need us to be something in order to give himself to us. So how does this mystery, the knowledge of who God is, bring about heart encouragement, being knit together in love, and assurance of understanding? It's because God comes down to us where we are and brings hope to us in the darkest places. How are we to be encouraged? Because God meets us in our discouragement. How are we to be knit together in love? Because in the midst of our broken relationships and in our relational problems, God meets us in the midst. How are we to grow in, in uh, all the riches of full assurance of understanding? Because God meets us where we were blind. God meets us when we were darkened in mind and alienated from the life of God. Ephesians 4. In other words, God comes down. How are we to be encouraged? 2 Corinthians 7 verse 6 says, God is the God who comforts the downcast. It is because God who says he dwells in eternity and with him who is of a lowly, contrite heart. God says he's the God who cares for the orphan, the widow, the poor, the lowly. And if God is the God who cares for the lowly, how lowlier can you get than to be a sinner under condemnation? And so in order for us to be encouraged, how is it that we would ever be encouraged if God did not come down to us? Christ said that those who are blessed are the ones who are poor in spirit. Are you discouraged? Christ would say to you, don't lose heart. Do not be afraid. Come unto me, all who are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me, upon you. In other words, unite yourself to me. Learn of me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. How can we be healed of our discouragement? How can we know that God really meets with the lowly? Christ said he will not bruise, he will not break a bruised wheat reed or quench a smoldering flax. Are you right about to fizzle out in, in your life as a Christian? Are you right about to throw in the towel? Well, you need to hear that Christ is a Christ who will not break the bruised reed or quench the smoldering flax. Are you, are you a Christian who suffers in and out of repeated sin and failure and cycles? Well, you need to hear that Christ, the great high priest, says that he can deal gently for the the ones who commit sin, the ignorant, who commit sin uh, unknowingly, and the Christ who deals gently with the wayward, meaning the one who commits sin knowingly. Christ is able to deal gently with you. It is because he became sin who knew no sin. He unites himself to us, to you, to my, to our sin on the cross in order that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The Son of God takes our discouragement right through the cross, through the grave, and resurrects it into encouragement and comfort. 
If you are a believer in Christ, know that in Christ there is fresh encouragement right where you are right now. It's, Im it's important. So how are we to be knit together in love? Because the God who is love has come down in Jesus Christ. And that relationship of love before the world existed has now entered into time and space. The relationship of the love between the Father and the Son has now entered into our humanity. And so if the Son unites himself to you, you've been united into the fellowship of that love. And this love is such, is powerful that you cannot, receiving it, you cannot receive it without giving it. And if that's the case, then it's true what 1 John 4 verse 19 says, we love because he first loved us. The same love, Christ says, that the Father has always had for him is given to us. How are we to grow toward all riches of full assurance of understanding? Because in Christ are hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Because Christ comes to us through the word and declares to us that he is the word of God, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, that he has come to reveal the Father, He's come to say, abide in my word. If you abide in my word, you truly are my disciples. And you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. You want to know the full, you want to know all the riches of full understanding, full assurance of understanding. You will never, ever, ever have that apart from coming to Christ and knowing Christ, the way in which God has come down to us and revealed all of who he is to us. And I would say that where there is lack in any of these fruits, where there's lack in encouragement in the heart, where there's lack in love for all the saints, where there's lack in assurance, I, I will... I'm telling you, and I think by the authority of what is being declared here, that where there's lack in any of these things, it's because either one, the gospel is not being preached, or two, the gospel is not being believed. God wants us to have these benefits of the gospel. We need the gospel, the mystery of God both of the Father and the Son, to wash over us. And I think this is the point of the ladies' book study, Delighting in the Trinity. They're, they're coming together and knowing who God is. This is, this is where, this is the source of fruit in the church, knowing who God is in the gospel. And the last point that I wanted to bring out that I think uh, is in the text is that not only does the mini the ministry of the mystery of the go of the gospel bring about these fruits, but it also protects us from false teaching. If you look in verse five, no, verse four. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. In other words, these knowing the gospel and attaining the benefits that can come from the gospel protects us from false teaching. Now I don't want to go too far or too mu uh, too much more than what I have to right now because we're going to go into the false teaching and learn more in Colossians, Lord willing. But I want you to notice one thing, that where there is false teaching, the very opposite of these benefits happen. 
Where there is false teaching, there will be discouragement. Where there is false teaching, there won't be unity. There won't be a knitting together in love. There will be disunity and division. Where there is false teaching, there will not be an assurance of understanding. And there definitely won't be an all riches of full assurance of understanding. But where there is false teaching, there will be confusion, there will be ignorance, and there will be unassurance. And the only ones that are getting any benefits or uh, have any have any uh, pleasure are the ones at the top, usually in false teaching, usually in cults. Everyone else is despairing on the bottom, but the few at the top are getting their pleasure. And so uh, with this message, I... W- I commend to all of us that we participate in God's burden for the church and that we would grow in the knowledge of this mystery of God, both of the Father and the Son, that we would receive fresh encouragement from the gospel in our hearts, that we'd be more and more knit together in love, and that we'd strive together, and that we would strive together for all the riches of full, under- full assurance of understanding.